we have followed a bill through the House of Representatives. We have followed a bill through the Senate. These processes are pretty similar, um, but there are also big opportunities for the bills to be messed up. And uh, now we are going to look at what happens to this bill that has finally made it through the House and the Senate. So we're going to what we call joint action. When we talk about joint action, we mean that the House and the Senate are finally working together on the bill. In this case, what you see here in the picture is a conference committee. You'll notice this is not a fancy committee room like in any of the other pictures we've seen before. Because this is temporary and is just going to be used for this one step in the process, these are like folding tables with uh, tablecloths and things. So here we have a group of uh, senators and a group of representatives working together in a conference committee. If we have made it, if we have been very lucky and our bill has made it through steps one through six in the House of Representatives, and we are insanely lucky and that bill has somehow made it through steps one through six in the Senate, if it has made it through the House and the Senate, finally, we can head to step seven, which is a conference committee. You guys know conference committee by now. The conference committee's job is to make compromises between the House and the Senate versions of the bill. The conference committee is made up of members of the House that the Speaker has chosen and members of the Senate that the Senate Majority Leader has chosen. So chances are that these are, are going to be all members of the, of the party that the leader belongs to. So if the Speaker of the House is a Democrat, uh, she can pick all Democrats for the conference committee. If the Senate Majority Leader is a Republican, he can pick all Republicans for the committee here. But what they have to do is they have to make a compromise version of the bill that can go back to the House and the Senate to be voted on. Okay, so if the House passed a uh, the House passed a law that says paint every building red, the Senate passed a law that says paint every building blue. What they've done is they've passed similar versions of a bill about painting buildings, but they'll have to come to a compromise on the details here. And in this case, we would hope that they would be able to say, okay, let's paint every building purple. Uh, now, what they're doing here is they are making changes to the bill for any difference between the House version and the Senate version of the bill. This is still like they have to be careful about this because it's going to have to go back to the House floor to be voted on again. If anyone like if they make changes that won't be supported by members of their own chamber then the bill is going to die here in this in the conference committee so the conference committee has a very important job they're making a compromise bill from the house and the senate versions of the bill once we have a compromise version of the bill from the house and the senate now the house and the senate both get a chance to vote again on the new version of the bill so they must vote on the compromise version that was created by the conference committee. So if any words of the bill changed at all, it must be voted on again. So in this case, our advantage here is they're no longer allowed to make any amendments or changes. Nobody can, uh, nobody can add things to the bill to mess up what the bill is supposed to do or anything like that. This is the version of the bill that was written by the conference committee. So this was written by members of the House and Senate working together to find a compromise. Now, what's going to happen here, because the details of this bill have changed, is we'll probably have some members of the House and some members of the Senate change their votes. They may not be happy with the compromises made. So the new version of the bill here is likely to get less votes in one chamber or the other. So we risk the compromises being unacceptable to members of the House and the Senate. And this is another opportunity for this bill to die. So this compromise version of the bill must be approved by a majority of the House members again, and it must be approved by a majority of the Senate members again. And since uh, they are voting on this in the Senate, this does create another opportunity to filibuster and kill this bill. But we are insanely lucky. Our bill makes it through step eight, and that means we move on to a whole other branch of government. Congress has done their job, so the legislative process is complete. Now it heads to the executive branch, and it's time to see what the president thinks of this bill. So in the back there, you see President Obama signing a bill surrounded by senators who worked on the bill. Um, and then there's our friend President Trump 
up front. So the bill must, like in the whole process of writing the law, they must consider what the president thinks of the bill. One of the president's roles that we'll talk about is called the chief legislator. That means that he has the final say over all policy passed by Congress. And this is, this is what happens. This is our last step here. Once Congress has done all of those things, and maybe we've gotten insanely lucky for our bill to uh, make it through the House and the Senate, make it through uh, the uh, conference committee process, get voted on again, now it goes to the president. And the president has three options here. The president either signs the bill into law. This would be what happens if the president approves the bill. If the president approves the bill, we're going to have one of those fancy signing ceremonies that you just saw in the picture. So we'll have a big ceremony. The president will write his name on the bill. The congressmen will all stand around. Everyone will celebrate. We have finally turned a bill into a law. However, the president has the final say here. If the president does not like the bill that got passed, the president can veto the law. The president can just say, I think this bill sucks. I'm not going to pass it. He rejects the bill and it goes back to Congress. If Congress, they do have an opportunity to override the president's veto, but that requires two thirds of both houses of Congress. So we need two thirds of the House to agree and we need two thirds of the Senate to agree to override the president's veto, which is very, very rare that we would have that much support for a bill. The most likely scenario where that happens is a situation where Congress has passed a law that limits the president's power. So if a president has done something that's caused Congress to rethink presidential powers, they may pass a law that limits the president's powers. Any president is going to veto a law that limits his or her powers. But this is one of the few things that Republicans and Democrats in the Congress can come together on. They're trying to limit the power of the president to protect the power of Congress. They're often able to override a veto, but it takes a very, very high number for the veto to be overridden, uh, to the veto to be overridden by Congress. Now, the third option for the president here, this is what we call a pocket veto. Basically, the president ignores the law. Okay, he doesn't sign it, he doesn't reject it. Um, if we'll get into the details of this later with the president, but if Congress is out of session, Congress is back home in their constituencies or whatever, they're not currently meeting, the president ignores the law for 10 days, it's vetoed. So he just lets the bill die. So here, the president has three options. Two of those three options are um, result in our bill dead. But one of those options, the president has signed the law, and we have turned our bill into a law, and we can all celebrate. Speaking of celebrating here, let's get a big bottle of water. Here's our friend, President Trump. It's time to celebrate with some bigly ideas. So let's go through the main things that you need to remember about this process. What are the main things we're going to see on the AP exam? First things, we want to make sure that we can figure out where are the obstacles to the bill getting passed. Okay, this is definitely not a simple process. Every step along the way created an opportunity for the bill to die. So we need to be thinking about that, okay? We need to be thinking about all the different ways that the bill could be ruined or where the bill could die. The other main thing to think about, where are the opportunities to change the bill? So think about the power that the standing committee has. Think about the power of the committee chairman. Think about what could happen to that bill once it gets onto the floor of the House or Senate. Absolutely, we need to understand how the agenda is controlled in the House and the Senate. So think about the House majority, I mean, think about the House Rules Committee and think about the Senate majority leader. Those are the, the committee and the person who has control over the agenda in their chamber. And always important because it always pops up on the exam, make sure that we can explain what the conference committees do. And the conference committees are another obstacle to the passage of the bill and the committee the conference committees are also another opportunity to amend the bill all right so there we go that's our most complicated process in all of ap government how does a bill become a law so hopefully our adorable little bill friend has survived all of these obstacles uh, they are still alive they've been signed into law and we can celebrate uh, but now that we have talked about the lawmaking process for a few days, we're going to shift, spend our remaining time in Congress talking about the election process, something that's always on the minds of our congressmen, of our representatives and our senators.